caramba! Der Witterung und niedriger Wolkendecke vollzog sich auch heute der Lufttransportverkehr nach Berlin planmäßig. Insgesamt wurden heute 40 Maschinen mit Kohle für die Berliner Westsektoren erwartet. Not long ago, a group we call the Air Corps helped win the war and took a bow. Not long ago, we cheered the fighting air call. Let's see what's happened to them now. Operation Vittles will soon be on our way with coal and wheat and hay, and everything's okay. Operation Vittles, as in the sky we go, we won't forget to blow a kiss to Uncle Joe. We're going wonder on the wild blue Ladies and gentlemen, I'm honored to welcome you to our, let's call it entertainment. I want to tell you a story which took place more than 40 years ago. Some of you will call me a liar or a dreamer in view of what you will hear from me. But I assure you, everything I will tell you has taken place in reality. To describe my experience as exact as possible, I suggest that we first take a look at the events of these days. Let's turn back the clock 40 years. 1948, three years after the end of World War II, and yet the world hasn't calmed down. 1945 is the start of a new era which will take Europe's breath away. The nuclear age has begun. Since the 16th of July, 1945, the day on which the Americans blew up their first atomic bomb in the desert of New Mexico, it's easy to see that war from now on doesn't simply mean war anymore. Now a new component has been added which brings along a new dimension of horror and destruction. Hiroshima and Nagasaki are only the first horrifying examples. 1945 also starts off a new era of politics between the USA and the Soviet Union. During the Second World War, brothers in arms. Now after the war has ended, there is some tension because of their different interests in world politics. Under Harry S. Truman and Joseph Stalin, both superpowers, which is the new name these countries earn by having extremely strong economies and military, try to outdo each other in the struggle for world domination. This is the foundation of the Cold War. The scene on which the superpowers' interests clash together is Germany. After the war, the Allies occupied and divided it between each other. Each of the four nations, which are besides the USA and the Soviet Union, France and England, takes over the sole control for their own zone. 
Berlin, former capital city of the now shattered Reich, is given a special status by dividing it, as with the whole of Germany before, into four sectors. The question what the future of Germany should look like already causes the first problems between the Western Allies and the Soviet Union. However, there are some efforts to find a solution for all zones. Yet both sides are only interested to install their own system in all of Germany. Until spring 1948, there are still negotiations to find a unified destiny for Germany, but there is no way back from the division. On the 20th of March 1948, the Soviets withdraw from the Allied Control Council, in which representatives of the four occupying powers make decisions about German politics. As the Western Allies agree to a currency reform, the division from the Eastern Zone is final. Und unverzüglich wurde die westliche Währung ausgegeben. Jeder Schein mit einem B gestempelt. B wie Berlin. Jeder Schein ein Garantieschein, dass die alte Hauptstadt weder zu Ostdeutschland noch allein zu Westdeutschland, sondern zum ganzen Deutschland gehören soll. The Soviets react by also introducing a currency reform and by increasing pressure on the western sectors of Berlin. Befehl des obersten Chefs der sowjetischen Militärverwaltung in Deutschland Nummer 111. Unter Berücksichtigung der Wünsche der demokratischen Öffentlichkeit befehle ich ab 24. Juni 1948 auf dem gesamten Territorium der sowjetischen Besatzungszone Deutschlands und auf dem Gebiet von Groß-Berlin neue Geldscheine einzuführen. Already in spring, there have been disturbances of traffic to Berlin from the side of the Soviets. Now the situation is getting hot. Stalin wants to force the Western powers to leave Berlin by stopping all trains into and out of Berlin on the 19th of June. There are supposed to be some technical problems, a message on the 23rd of June says. After this, nothing moves anymore. All of the routes, by water and by land, into Berlin are cut off. The blockade of Berlin begins. The first day of the blockade already brings out 50,000 people who gather in the Hertha Stadium to hear Ernst Bruder. This man will stand for uncompromising endurance during the following 12 months. Ernst Bruder had been elected mayor last year, but the Soviets didn't want him. His words addressed to the people of Berlin go around the world. Ihr Völker der Welt, ihr Völker in Amerika, in England, in Frankreich, schaut auf diese Stadt und erkennt, dass ihr diese Stadt und dieses Volk nicht preisgeben dürft, nicht preisgeben könnt. But there is another man who appears at the beginning of the blockade. And he will become a symbol figure for a free Berlin along with Ernst Ruder. His name is Lucius D. Clay, general and military governor in the American zone. On the 25th of June, he starts an operation which will guarantee West Berlin survival and freedom for the next 12 months. Operation Vittles, the biggest air transport action in history, commences. Until the Soviets stop the blockade on the 12th of May, 1949, every day there will be up to 400 airplanes which fly up to 6,000 tons of coal, goods and food into the locked up city. At the end of this operation, there will be the fantastic figure of 1 million tons of goods which has been pushed through the airlift. But the airlift is not the only answer the Americans have got for Stalin. At the end of June, 1948, Six American B-29 bombers land on the south coast of England. These planes can carry atomic bombs. Here and now I will start to tell my story of that time, which can't be read even in today's history books. Nevertheless, it has taken heavy influence on Berlin, and with this on the whole world. But let us start at the beginning. Washington's Declaration. The bomber planes which were commanded to England did not carry any atomic bombs is true, and yet it is not the whole truth. The cargo of some transport planes was withheld. These planes arrived on the 26th of June, three days before the bomber planes arrived from the USA, and they were supposed to carry radio technology for West Berlin. 
but the truth about their cargo is far more interesting. The planes carry the atomic bombs for the bombers, which will arrive in three days' time. The Pentagon wants to be ready if there would be any further escalation of the Berlin crisis. On the other hand, no one shall know of the atomic bombs in England, because the situation is so tense, it could not bear any further incident. This is the reason why, besides the President, only a handful of men in the Pentagon know of this. One of these men is Colonel Harris. He is in command of a unit which guards and prepares an eventually necessary atomic strike. Up to now, Colonel Harris has already served the Air Force for 23 years and is known to be strictly loyal, which will prove to be a mistake of serious consequence. On the 27th of September, it is now about three months ago since the bombs have been brought to England, a U.S. Army lorry leaves the military airfield at about 2300. Inside the lorry, besides the two drivers, there is also Colonel Harris, who states that he has to supervise the transport of badly needed technical instruments to Berlin personally. The truth is, at this moment, Harris is leaving the airbase with one of the atomic bombs to an unknown destiny. Next morning, a deserted lorry is found in the woods near the airbase. There is no trace of Colonel Harris, the drivers, or any technical instruments. In Washington, the message of the disappeared atomic bomb creates horror. The Soviets are estimated to be the wire drawers. For the Americans, a race against time begins. The bomb has to get back into the right hands before Stalin's thieves manage to bring their hot freight to safe ground. Once behind the Iron Curtain, Stalin would possess the power to put up enough pressure against the Western powers. The escalation of the Berlin crisis would only be a matter of time. Inside the Pentagon, heads are steaming in the highest ranks of the Army and the Secret Service. How can we get back the bomb without arising too much trouble, for this is still a top secret action? The CIA uses its whole strength and uses every single agent in Europe to track down the bomb. And believe it or not, on the 29th of September, just 48 hours after the bomb disappeared, there are some hot traces. It leads directly to Berlin, which is already scenario of the clash between East and West, but now becomes even more important. The same evening, a man arrives at the airport of Berlin Tempelhof. All of the Americans' hope is now resting on this man's shoulder. He must bring back the bomb. His name is Sam Porter. Actually Samuel, but he never could spell this name. He is the top CIA agent and has just been called back from an important mission in Spain. His new mission is to stop Harris from passing on the bomb to Stalin's agents. This could happen any hour.